Gracias, director. Eh, bueno, muy rápidamente, lo diré un poco en inglés porque yo creo que al final eh, lo cambié de aquí porque queremos o necesitamos escuchar en inglés. Eh, my colleague, Dr. Imre Horvath, thanks for being here. He's absolutely happy that University of Delft look at uh, our university and our school of engineering. Uh, Dr. Imre is professor of computer and design engineering, which is a very nice topic related to the things we are doing in this school of engineering. Um, he's been a lot of things, you know. He's actually he's advisory board of a very interesting journal in the field of engineering design, for example, the Computer and Design Journal. Um, he initiated in like 15 years ago a very nice series of conference uh, called um, it's a long it's a long title but tools and methods of competitive engineering the international symposium and we are pleased to host this uh, conference in 2018 in May and well let me just put some topics of his um, interest for example uh, he's dealing with philosophical aspect of design. He's working on computer support of conceptual design to feature di digital design studies. In summary, a very nice uh, series of fields related to design. So please uh, take care of what he is uh, telling us in this conference. And Professor Imre, it's our honor to be you here. The chairman. Microphone is still up a little bit, so I have to find the head for it. Dear Chairman, thank you so much for this kind introduction. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon to all of you. Let me start with a question. Is there any industrial design engineer here? Oh, wonderful. Because I have to confess that I tailor uh, the content of my presentation to industrial design engineering students, but I also would like to be useful for those who are not practicing in this particular field, and I hope that you will uh, find it interesting. The title there, which is a little bit long, actually gives a good synopsis of my presentation. Because as you see, I want to talk about a new age. I want to talk about new systems, new services, new challenges for you, students, and for us, teachers. Because we have a common problem and we share. So in this almost one hour presentation, I would like to uh, summarize my personal thoughts on this. It is not a official representation of the school, this is just my thoughts. Hope you will find it interesting. Uh, going into the content of the lecture, first of all, what I would like to do is to talk about the influencing trends. What we have to be aware of, because there are some mega trends which are very, very important. And then, obviously, I would like to talk about the impact, what they cause in everything and in everywhere, and then to go into those particular design challenges what we are facing and what we have to solve, and then for, uh, to make two, let's say, very representative student project visible for you very briefly, how those things, what I discussed, appear already in graduation project and obviously then I would like to summarize some takeaways for you what you have to consider if you want to plan your future as an industrial design engineer. This is the sense of the presentation. Let's start from the very beginning. So I would like to talk first about the mega trends. What is a mega trend for you? Have you ever heard about a mega trend? Can you mention one? Who can? I'm sure this is just the first moment when we still have to warm up, but everybody has in mind. So who is the bravest? Me. <laughs> then I have to say that actually what is interesting here, and first of all we have to see, is that sort of mega trend 
what is formed by the so-called industrial revolutions. And it is interesting to see what's going on there because it already teaches us to something. These are the products what we typically design, for instance, coffee maker, fridge, and so on and so on. In this particular case, actually, some traditional industrial engineering competence, for instance, drawing uh, capabilities and then form giving capabilities, uh, considering sustainability, considering, for instance, uh, all kinds of things related to the materialization, these are the important aspects. But you will see that actually this type of product will not be too much relevant in some 20, 30 years and for the reason that you will be active in that period of time, it's better to start preparing for that period of time and to see what sort of products can we expect at that time. So let's look into these megatrends, what I said, because obviously they will have the largest effect on everything. First of all, if I want to diagram what is going on, then I have to start with the first industrial revolution, what you most probably know, that started somewhere at the beginning of the 17th century, and it had two or three major innovations at that time, for instance, using wind energy, using water energy, and using steam energy. And soon after it was followed by the second industrial revolution, which was about the exploiting and, in a sense, the discovering the power what we have in fossil energy carriers. And then soon after came the third industrial revolution, characterized by the proliferation, introduction and proliferation of the electronics. Obviously, it uh, brought, in, brought in a different dimension from the material to the somewhat immaterial field where things are happening but we cannot capture directly. And then the third, uh, sorry, the fourth industrial revolution even put it further because this is the period of the information processing and computing and computer application. It has a radical change already in our life. Why? Because while we try to implement tools for supporting our motor and mechanic activities, with the computer technology, everything is moving into the cognitive domain of the human being. This is a very important megatrend, considering the fact that actually from the mid uh, of the, this century, we are talking about the fifth industrial revolution, which is the revolution of the intelligence. This, obviously, will have a radical effect on the product, everything, what we have, because some people say that, yes, if we have this technology of intelligence, then most probably very soon our products will be intelligent as well. And many of you, I believe, immediately associate to intelligent cars and similar products. Yes, this is what I'm talking about. But, what is also interesting here, first of all, if you see these sort of lines of the time period, there is something what you have to see there. May I ask you to share what you see if you just look at the dates? Can you see something which is interesting there? Exactly. And it is an indication of the acceleration. So everything is accelerating, you know. So while we had something like 50 years from the electronics to the computer, we had just less than 30 years for the appearance of the intelligence. And then obviously, anybody of you can ask, what is the next? What can we expect? What is around 2040, 2050? Yes, it is a big question. I don't know the answer. So next time you have to invite someone else who can give the answer to it. But this is also important observation and also important that as you look at the products what we have, then we definitely have to observe a kind of functional and structural complexity increase. And this is also something what the product designer should take into consideration. Let's go further because Obviously, I said that the computer technology is driving these rapid changes. But do we know enough about computer technology? 
we can talk about 60 years when we have computers and for instance to see this is how it started in the 60s, 70s, we had digital mainframe computers. I believe even the oldest colleagues are not really aware of these sort of things. I, at the university time, I saw still things like this. But later on, in the 80s, actually came the natural personal computing. You are familiar already with it, because we still use it. But the next step was also there soon after, which is called the embedded ubiquitous computing. Embedded, when it is pervasive and in the surroundings, and uh, ubiquitous, also in that sense, that it is mobile. You can take it with you. And all kinds of implementations are there. You don't have to spend too much time to figure out what these are. Yeah. But obviously, the computer technology goes further. And now we have, actually, the fourth paradigm of computer technology, which is the cyber-physical computing. Maybe someone knows what it is. The silence says that later on I have to revisit this particular issue, and I will do, because I am prepared for it. So, the other thing what I'm asking you at this very moment, remember that there is a new paradigm which is cyber-physical computing and it does something different than we traditionally did or the computers did. But, you know, the problem is that right after cyber-physical computing, which is manifested already in uh, applications like you can see on the image, we have some other developments as well. And for this moment, the computer world is in a big dilemma because we don't know exactly where to go and how to go further. For the reason, because there are two competing paradigms nowadays. One of them, the paradigm of quantum computing, and the second paradigm is the so-called biological computing. And what we don't know at this very moment, if we have to pay attention only to physically based computing or biologically based computing or we have to make effort to combine the two. These are open issues for the scientists at this very moment but already important for us to see that cyber-physical system is a current practice. Cyber-physical computing has already its own methodological and computational framework. Later on I will address this issue. So let's go further and let's see what are the influences, what will be changed here. First of all, the major change, I believe, will come from the fact of that sort of complexification what I already mentioned. That in product, everything comes together. See what we can expect. Again, if you consider the early 60s, 70s, at that time, the dream was to have advanced me mechatronic systems. Shortly after, the concept of the embedded systems appeared. If you consider your uh, washing machine at home, it definitely has an embedded system because otherwise you wouldn't be able to control it. And it wouldn't be able to do that particular program, what it is designed for. Then came, especially in real-time application, the distributed real-time system. If you consider your car, there are several subsystems in your car which are working as distributed real-time embedded system. Most probably, you can mention one. Can you? Most probably your brake system is working according to this. Or for instance, if you have a cruise control, most probably it is working according to these principles. But then life goes on, and here is something which is producing tickets for me to pay when I am over speeding. These are the network agent-based systems, which are monitoring the speed of the car and recording immediately whenever you go beyond a threshold and the processing is just automatic and then you will have beautiful, nice, uh, pinky uh, envelopes in the Netherlands whenever these systems are working. And then the next one, what is already most probably known to you, the Internet of Things. 
which is connecting object in order to have highway, data highways in between. And then comes the next one. Some 10 years ago, this was the example for it, the psychophysical systems, but you will see that these scientifically based systems are coming into our daily practice. This will be the topic what we are doing. Let's try to summarize what's going on here then. First of all, there is one player, the computer technologies. The second player is the nanotechnologies, the material science technologies. Then the next one is the next working technologies. And the fourth one is the biotechnologies. And what is interesting that we are living in an age when everything comes together. And this forms the complexity. This is what we have to deal with. But obviously, in this particular case, just to be a good software programmer, or to be a mechanical designer, or to be a, someone who is, uh, specializes in electrotechnic, is not enough. So these are direct consequences here. We need something which will be a transdisciplinary te technology and uh, transdisciplinary system science. And obviously, there is a new name for this is cybernetics, and we are already doing research into fully cybernetics based systems. The most important thing here that the physical part and the cyber part, the data, the software, the knowledge, everything of the system are coming together, and the distance, what we could observe 10, 15 years ago, is gradually disappearing. So actually, the hardware is also a cyberware. Just consider, for instance, a chemical sensor and similar things are all of that. So we have to be aware of this uh, explanation, uh, this uh, implications on the real life practice. And here is a video what I would like to show you. Sorry, I have to find first of all. Just see what it is. I'm talking about. When everything comes together and has got a synergy, then we can have these sort of systems. It seems to be a little bit futuristic, but this video, what I received from the colleagues at the Hiroshima University, are already talking about 
what this type of system can do. A complex service. So actually the traditional mechanical functions are converted into services. And this is the new orientation. So I believe, as industrial design engineers, you have to take into consideration that you have to be able to cope with these sort of complexities. You have to be able to provide synergy between the hardware, software, cyberware elements of the system. But let's go further. Let's see. What else is here? This part will be a kind of clarification about the concept of cyber-physical systems. Maybe it is new to you, it is new to me as well, I have to tell. That's why we are doing research in this particular field. But maybe the knowledge what I intend to share with you can get a kind of uh, implication for you what it is and what it is all about. So, obviously, when we want to talk about cyber-physical systems, first of all, we have to see that it is a whole research topic at this very moment. Many people say that this is the technology of the future. Many people say that, yes, already in the, in the beginning of the 21st century, actually cyber-physical computing and cyber-physical systems are converting our daily reality into something which we have to be aware of. A cyber-physical system can be defined as a network multi-actor system. Please recall what you have seen in the video. Network multi-actor system. Human involved. It is enabled by cyber-physical computing. The essence of cyber-physical computing that the systems are penetrating, it comes later on, it will be repeated, penetrates into daily life and rather than being fully pre-programmed, they collect data from the daily life and try to build up their operation strategy. So this is somewhat against the von Neumann and Turing type of principle of computing because here the determinism is much lower. So actually the operational strategy uh, built up according to the uh, circumstances, according to the context of the operation of the system. This is a new element here, and here obviously in the definition it is something which has a distinguishing feature. And then synergistic compositional system. Again, the video showed how many things, robots, different type of robotic manipulators, all kind of visualization display devices, communication, remote communication devices are there. So this is why it is synergetic and composition. And then characterized by the uh, uh, following features, here is what I said, one of the major characteristics is the deep diffusion into the real life physical processes in, and implementing a kind of sensing, reasoning, adapting and actuating loops and obviously they manage, because otherwise they wouldn't be able to adopt, a resource base and they can build and activate from these particular resources and also they are focusing on service provisioning. And with, with these capabilities we have the chance to get them involved in socialized tasks, for instance supporting people activities. And this is a new element because none of the system categories, paradigms, what we heard about until now, were able to do this, to be partner of the human in different contexts. So, if you want to see examples, I can talk about certain first-generation cyber-physical systems, for instance, an airport traffic control system, or for instance, robotic military design combat system, or for instance, automated logistic systems, or smart electric uh, generator system. These are first-generation systems. What is interesting here, that they don't show high-level smartness. However, as we move towards the second generation of cyber-physical system, we will be able to expect much higher level of smartness. Because in these other examples, this is dominating. For instance, the self-driving cars, or you can call it autonomous driving, or, or intelligent car. 
They cannot be expected without this deep penetration into the real life process because otherwise you will not be able to recognize a pedestrian or you don't know what is the, the, the traffic situation around you. It cannot be pre-programmed because it's dynamically changing. But also if you consider, for instance, but most probably you have also at this university, we have at that university a kind of follow me printing system. Wherever you are in the university campus, if you want to make a 3D uh, printing part or you want to have a document, you just have to identify yourself with your card and immediately the services are provided for you. But also, for instance, the caregiving system, which include, may include robotics and may include cognitive and perce cognition and perception support system, this also can be considered. And finally, just to tell you, if you ever will think about having a PhD in this particular field, my PhD students develop this particular system, which is for stroke rehabilitation. And obviously you know that uh, stroke rehabilitation is reduced just for robotic assistant, the efficiency is very low. However, what we invented here is that we monitor the engagement and based on the engagement we introduce change in the operation of the system and this way we can support much more effectively the patient. So these are examples. So it means that, yes, industrial design task when we are facing human aspects, when we are uh, facing needs, then this is what we can do. And then, what I mentioned, penetration into the real life process. This is something very important because it may happen in an uncountable ways of uh, happening. For instance, a system can be so simple penetrating into plants. For instance, in, a, in, in the agricultural application, you can see that the watering, what is needed for the plants, is really there. You just have to apply a specific uh, sensor which is developed for this particular purpose. And you know that if you need watering or not. And then obviously it is immediately a sustainability is issue because you don't have to waste water when it is not needed, but definitely you have to apply water when it is needed and in this way it is very efficient. But maybe strange, but monitoring, for instance, animals and the behaviors of animals and protecting animals, it's also possible in this way. Or if, for instance, which is a more practical application, the household appliances, the traffic equipment, everything, even the living environments can be equipped with all kinds of sensing and actuating facilities and this provides a completely new basis for us for designing services again because here not the artifact is important anymore but the services, what it does. And then obviously further down the road in human context, some uh, cases for instance when, when, uh, when there are um, uh, bodily handicap situations, these cyber-physical systems can be the only solution because, for instance, they can get the control information from the nurse and can convert it into a physical convert, uh, control information and the, the cyber-physical system can monitor the intent, for instance, of the person and accordingly can support the activities of the arm or leg or whatever. So, bright new opportunities, but we have to forget the past and think a little bit out of the box because otherwise we don't uh, reach to this situation. So the real-time computing really enables the cyber-physical systems to adapt to different uh, operation modes, sensing, reasoning, learning, actuating, organizing their uh, operation, even evolving or reproducing themselves, obviously not a biological way, dynamically and reliably in context, these are the major features. So, cyber-physical systems are really important for the reason because they open up, open up a new path towards getting information from real-life processes which were not possible before. Let me go further a little bit. Because there are other aspects that we have to talk uh, about and uh, you as industrial designers should take into consideration. And this is the question of interaction with object. 
If you consider the past, actually we had a very simplified model. However, if we, in, if we put a question that who is initiating the interaction, and we try to put the human and the system into this framework, we can figure out new things here. Just let's see. So here is a kind of search domain. Human, human, human system array. The traditionally what happened is the human-human interaction, it happened. Obviously the next one is the system, human system interaction. When I'm controlling my laptop with this remote mouse, I am the initiator and the computer is controlled, so this is a typical human system interaction. But obviously, if I drew these two additional fields, most probably there must be something there. Yes. The first one is the system human interaction. Can you mention an example when, based on the initiation, system human interaction is happening? Sorry. For instance, this is also. But any time, for instance, a patient is manipulated by the robot, the robot should make a decision how to interact with the human being. Very good. Thank you so much for your interest. And the last, last one, what we were not considering in the past, the system-system interaction. And what is interesting here, that when we are talking about cyber-physical system, through the extensive multi-hierarchical connectivity, they are moving towards systems of systems. So most of the cyber-physical systems are not just single nodes, but connected network of agents or nodes forming a system of systems when we consider the collectivity. So for instance, the need for the system-system interaction comes out from this concept of system of systems because otherwise even a kind of hierarchical way we cannot control. But obviously there are many other forms of systems, uh, system communication. Just consider for instance when your GPS system while you are driving localizing your uh, position and immediately ask traffic information from a completely different system which makes it possible for you to progress in a particular way which is not limiting your intention. So these are there. But as you see, the interaction really plays an important role here and the concept of the interaction is changing rapidly. This is what we, industrial design engineers, should take into consideration. But what is also important, an additional topic here, that not just the parties involved in the interaction changing, but also the level of interaction. Let's see what it means. The level of interaction. Let's suppose that we have two agents, A and Z, far away from each other, and then let's suppose that there is some sort of possibility for physical connectivity. Because otherwise, obviously, the connection cannot be realized in the real world. But then, what we know from the past, that whenever we have an electric circuit with a switch, we switch it on, switch it off, and it makes a kind of statistic. But it is purely in, related to the signals in the system, if the signal is transmitted or not. That's all. This is what we can do on the lowest level. Comes then the next level, which is about representation, for instance, conveying this information based on languages. And when we are on this level, then we are talking about syntax level interaction. And the syntax level uh, interaction actually uh, conveys a particular representation and try to understand on the receiver side this particular representation and convert it into something that is to be done. Already with this syntactical conversion we have problems. Because every system has its own coding scheme and obviously it is sometimes <coughs> difficult to be understood by others. But now the real sexy part is coming. 
Because obviously above the syntax level, V, industrial designer, should consider a next level, especially when we are talking about cognitive interaction with smart systems. And this level is the level of semantics. Understanding the things and interpreting the things. And here, what I believe important is not to think anymore about signals or language-based representation, but to think of thoughts. What sort of ideas, what sort of thoughts are we conveying? And how can it be interpreted on the other side? I tell you frankly that this is a rather vaguely addressed field at this very moment. Obviously, you heard about ontologies, you heard about semantic web technologies or whatever the future tells if they will ever be able to cope with this sort of semantic problem. But the life is not stepping or more not stopping and we have a next level which is about the pragmatics. Pragmatics is very simple. You understand my question, my uh, presentation. This is the semantics level. But immediately you ask, why this guy is talking about these sort of things? What can I do with it? This is the pragmatic, pragmatism. Why is it important for me beyond the attached level of understanding? And this is something what was not considered until now when we are designing interfaces. Please consider the smartphone interface what you have, or consider, for instance, a radio interface. Pragmatism, not considered at all. When we are talking about pragmatism, actually we want to talk about the realization of the intent. So if an action is planned, is this action really executed as it is expected on the receiver side? But would you believe the life goes on? And there is a fifth level which is also important. Because when you are listening to my presentation, Yes, you understood it. You believe that, okay, this guy told me something, but I have to check in the, on the internet and maybe I can find something for my studies or whatever. But there is one more question related to that. Are you pleased with it? Are you happy with it? Because my presentation cannot be a good presentation if you don't reach that level when it gives you satisfaction that I didn't waste the time when I was sitting in this particular presentation, but I really got something for the future, and this guy really delivered what he promised. I don't know if I am able to do it, but I'm just explaining what is on my slide. So in this particular case, we are talking about the apobatics level of communication. And apobatics is about the raised emotions, the engagement, the satisfaction, and these sort of words and are you designing any products what you are designing for satisfaction, for please, for experiencing? This is what this system is all, this level is all about. And this is a new element what we didn't consider. It. So here the intended target is to have some sort of emotional status, and then is this emotional status realized on the other side? Not only just the action completed, no, what is the feeling related to that? Is this pleasing or not? This is the complex level of interaction, what we can talk about and what we have to consider. So, just to summarize for you that when you want to design for this level, what to consider? That it is about the statistics, obviously it is not more just about the transfer of the signals. When it comes to the next level, the, the, the syntax, it is typically language type of interpretation. When we go further to semantics, what we are interested in, the meaning. What does it mean? When we go further than the pragmatics, this is the quality of operation, how the tasks are executed. And then when we go to the higher level, actually this is the success, what we have to consider. So please remember to these five key words, because they are explaining everything what actually the modern uh, time those people who are designing interactions with systems are considering already. So far, so good. 
and you say, this is a nice theory. Yes, I could follow it. I don't didn't understand every details of it, but it is a nice story. But what it has to do with the daily practice? Look, I have a different video. Uh, I tested the, the sun, and for some reason, in this case, in the, with this video, the sun didn't come through. Therefore, I will launch the video just apart. And please enjoy it. comes here together. All the five levels of interaction, what I said, between human and system, system and system, this is an example, and this is not a fiction. I got this particular video from my colleagues at the BMW three months ago, just before the Christmas. But they are already working on the implementation of this. So, if you want to have a good position, with these companies, please start rereading my presentation. That's one of the advice. But let's go back and let's switch back to the presentation. The next topic, what I would like to briefly discuss with you, is the issue of smart products and services. Because I believe they will be in the focus. And we have to understand what really makes a product smart and how can we achieve it. Because it's not so simple thing. Can you imagine a computer control system in which the information is not pre-programmed? So actually, the system is able to organize its operation based on runtime acquired information. This is the major issue here. If you want to have smart systems, this is something that we have to uh, consider. And then, what the system needs to have. Actually, I already explained it to you in the context of cyber-physical systems. I just want to revisit it from a different perspective, namely from the perspective of increasing the intelligence of these systems. What a system should do, first of all, has to observe physical processes. Did the BMW car observe? Yes, obviously. Directly and indirectly. Then the next one is to reason. Did it reason? Yes, of course, otherwise it wouldn't have stopped when a not visible passenger was just crossing the, the, uh, uh, the street in front. 
And then obviously what it did, it also learned. Because those sort of speed changes, for instance, when it went into a, a urban area and there was, for instance, a big lorry in front, you could see that although it was on a self-driving mode, it reduced the speed. Because it learned that whenever there is something which is unusual, I have to change the speed, for instance, at least. Better than sometimes we do, or at least I do. Then the next one is adapt. This changing the speed is one form of the adaptation, but this particular car did many other things. So, if you consider that the basic operation of the smart system is this repeated loop. Observe, reason, learn, adopt, and do it continuously in the time. Actually, isn't it what we are doing? This is the model how we are doing. So it is a very oversimplified model of our brain operation. Oversimplified. I underline it 25,000 times, but this is the situation. And then obviously, what is interesting here, and I told you that this new cyber-physical computing is overriding the traditional von Neumann type of computing, for the reason, because that is a finite information processing automaton, but this is a finite reasoning automaton. So it is just looping and in the meantime reasoning about what to do and how to do it. So you say, you are again not telling any new to me. I have my mobile phone, and my mobile phone is, for instance, monitoring when I'm jogging, and it is giving me information, for instance, about the blood pressure, or the distance I did, or if I was lazy, or not, and all those sort of things. It is true. The smartphone has been named as such for the reason because it is a first trial for the implementation of that sort of multiple reasoning loops, what I was talking about. Because if you consider what is there, here is a model, a simplified model. You have sensors, you have data receivers, you have a knowledge base which stores information, you have a cognitive mechanism, you have all kinds of interfaces, even with systems, you have actuators, data transmitters, that's all. We can say, but it is not true. Smart systems can do much more, because this system is not building awareness. This system is not adopted to different situations. It just collects information and processes it and feeds back to you, feeds back to you. But it is not changing itself. The essential element will be here when the system is able to change itself. And here is where we have to go to the field of artificial intelligence. And we have to see what sort of methods are out there for making the system smartness. And here is a model what actually I uh, uh, compiled on the five basic approaches of artificial intelligence. We can have symbolist approaches, for instance, the if-then type of production rules are typical representative of that. We can have connectionist approaches, just consider, for instance, neural networks are typically uh, uh, representing this category. Then we can talk about also evolutionary algorithm, genetic algorithm and whatever, most probably you have heard about it. We can talk about analogist approaches, for instance, case-based reasoning or pattern-based reasoning. These are all AI techniques. And we can also talk about probabilistic techniques and probabilistic methods. The problem is with it, I have to tell you, that these are all discrete domains of AI research. And for instance, the input of the connectionist approach cannot be yet the output of a, uh, a symbolic approach because unfortunately the representation is different. And this is true for all of them. So, symbolic approaches, connectionist approaches, analogist approaches, probabilistic approaches, here you see examples, are out there, but actually when we want to use them in our products, first of all, we have to create a synergy between them. So we have to embed them into that sort of looping reasoning process, what we were talking about. And this is not a simple task. So, when we are talking about smart products, you as designer, please consider the following properties. 
first one uh, of all, personalization. And AI methods are able to help you to monitor, for instance, the user or stakeholders and to introduce personalization. The next issue is the awareness. Things are happening in a particular situation and your smart product should be able to detect that particular situation when it opens. Then the next one is the situatedness. Obviously, the decision should be adopted to the actual decision point or expectation. The next one is the adaptiveness I mentioned. This is a very important new feature of the cyber-physical systems that they can implement self-adaptation. So they, without external programming or control, can adapt them, themselves to varying situations. And the connectedness, it is somewhat obvious in the age of Internet of Things, then the proactivity, we say that this sort of system can for, uh, should foresee what will happen. For instance, just consider a home care application when you have to monitor what the elderly do, does and react according to the intent, the observed actions, or the course of action. These are related to this. So, according to my view, this is again something to embed in your vocabulary and learn these terms and try to figure out that in a particular design context, what you can do. I promise to have two um, sample graduation project from my practice. Actually, the students were in there. What is interesting in this graduation project that actually they have a kind of invention, this sort of out-of-the-box thinking. What you would do, for instance, with a binocular? What would you do with it? Look at beautiful girls on the opposite side, or very masculine boys on the opposite side. This is one way of using it. But would you use it, for instance, for having a astronomical experience. So this is what is here. Look, there is a project which was about augmented astronomy. So actually, a traditional binocular was transformed into a cyber physical system. A cyber physical system which allowed the user to learn about astronomy because the system, you can download this project from the Delft University repository and look into the technical details, but the idea was that to have imaging combined with the real life observation and this way to place in the viewing field additional information what is having or what has had a kind of tutorial aspect. Easy to say, implementation was a little bit complicated because obviously it was dependent on very much on what the user wanted to do. And you had to recognize this and you had to have a controller. But actually this project was very successful. Here you can see the new implementation and with this particular students I went to the United States. We took part in the ASME uh, student uh, project competition and actually for this particular project he got the first prize. So I'm very proud of it. But the second one is also interesting. I don't know why the animation was dropped, because then I step back here, sorry for that, and my question is, how would you measure the periphery of a tree? Because if you have a, a agricultural farm which is producing three trees, obviously they have to cut, uh, or then cut, have to take the trees out at a particular optimum time, when they have a particular diameter, trunk diameter, and when they have, and when they have a particular shape or end. How would you do it? This particular project used cyber-physical technologies, namely laser imaging technology. Because small cameras, and now I, I show you the image, small cameras were assigned, this is the prototype what the students did, Small prototypes, uh, small uh, laser uh, projectors were uh, uh, placed around the tree trunk, and that was also a camera. 
Obviously, you could see the visual image of the projected laser light and the four segments around was combined into a image. And that was analyzed, and based on this, the circumference could be quantified. So actually, this particular uh, instrument was used for it. And then it was just put against the trunk, and the information was immediately sent to a kind of uh, collector which registered which tree is there and what sort of uh, information is related to it. So again, a kind of ingenuity to think about the product completely differently. Are these two guys new product? Are they smart? Yes, they are. And here is, for instance, the, the commercialized version which is already prepared for practical use, commerce, as I, I, I mentioned. So these are the things what I wanted to take up. And as a kind of summary before really exhausting you completely, let me use two slides to summarize what my real messages are to you. The very first thing is that please try to give more attention in your industrial design engineering study to systems. Everything is becoming a system, even complicated with the human presence, because the humans are also element of the system, so it is heterogeneous in a sense. But please try to learn every case how to design a system skillfully and purposefully. The next one is that, as you have seen, that the focus of the design is moving from the artifactual products to the services. I believe in the future you have to pay much more attention to the service design rather than the artifact design. What does it mean? You have seen some examples in my figures. Then, uh, obviously, we have to consider that cyber-physical system principle paradigm is a new opportunity for us, and uh, we have to learn how to develop engineered systems using the cyber-physical system paradigms. It is not so obvious. Everybody is talking about that these are the challenges, but please just check how many papers are published on solving those sort of challenges. This is the, a premature time of years. What is also important that don't forget what you can do with the cyber-physical system is to penetrate into real-life processes. And it is not, not a key question if you want to monitor children, if you want to do something with dogs, if you want to do something in greenhouses or whatever. I believe cyber physical system offers sufficient, sufficient opportunities for doing that. And obviously, this has to be converted into new functional opportunities, what is still a kind of uh, hot topic for the time being. And then obviously when you think about how to compose your study program and what sort of courses to include, my suggestion is that consider the following expectations, not for the university years, it goes by, it doesn't be important. Your 20, 30 years ahead, what you need to know, obviously there will be a lot of changes, but there are certain things what I believe you, you have to know. First of all, please try to learn Try to learn how to monitor social, business, technological, industrial trends in a kind of holistic framework. Not just focusing on one of them, but bring them together. The second thing is related to this. Please try to build up an attitude in which social need and technological affordances are coming together. The social needs should be recognized, the technical opportunity should be known, and you can design new things if these things form a synergy. The next one, what I also suggest, please try to build up capabilities for conceptualization of smart systems and especially smart services. As you have seen in my examples, it typically assumes a kind of out-of-the-box thinking. The basis of it, a kind of abstraction opportunity or, or case, um, capability. And what is interesting that in our current educational programs, actually we are not really supporting this abstraction capability, contrary to the fact that the course materials are becoming much more heterogeneous and overwhelming. The next is what I'm saying, uh, what I'm offering to you, 
that please try to master the development of smart reasoning mechanisms. I don't know if you are involved in that or not. I don't know if you ever had the need for it. But try to familiarize yourself with the AI methods. This is my personal suggestion. You can be a completely different uh, designer in the future if you have some ideas about what can you do with artificial intelligence methods. And finally, what I also suggest you to deal with, data analytics and exploring patterns and semantic information from real-life processes. This is a new feature, this is a new capability, the industry very much misses it, but when we are talking about complex systems which are producing data on a continual basis, obviously this is very important. So, I hope that I made a big confusion in your mind. It was a little bit intended. Because if you want to get the apple down from the tree, you have to shake the tree. This happened now. Thank you so much for your attention. I will understand it. I hope those let's use the psychophysical systems in this one. I simply don't dare to, pre, uh, how to say, pretend that I know the answer. The department, you know, I have to confess that maybe I don't know enough about the department. I also don't know about those sort of issues which are local here and important. All the words I ever ringing the bell for me when you are talking about that, okay, what is with sustainability, what is with the future, um, how we can think about, what we can anticipate in the future. These are all relevant thoughts. 
I apologize really for not being able to tell any concrete what to do in this particular situation. This is also a complex situation. So complex situation that actually research, large research teams are not able to offer particular solution. Obviously, uh, how to say, my, my, my heart is with this new paradigm of the systems. I believe it can do a lot, but it will not be a universal program solver. But we don't know, for instance, and I can uh, tell it uh, from my daily practice as a, as a senior <coughs> researcher who is working with uh, 10, 11 PhD students at this very moment. Uh, we don't know enough, and we have too much knowledge already. This is the con conflict, conflict situation. Every day I would need to read 100 papers. I have time for three. And at the same time, I cannot make an order in my mind that what I know, what is re the, the, the real knowledge. So your question is brilliant. I apologize not being able to give a, a more concrete answer to it. But, you know, my email, my contact addresses are there. Maybe in a PhD we can deal with it. Right. I wish you success. <laughs> Anything else? The chairman has left. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> But then but nothing would work. It would be incredible, but... Uh, it would be, but nothing would work. Excuse me. <laughs> I apologize. So I just wanted to react. So you said that everything is really connected. Yes. Okay. Where is this infrastructure that can do it? When, when, you, when you have still problems, for instance, accessing bank uh, websites, you know, if it is uh, overloaded. Where I want to get is, uh, do you think it, uh, it's something to be scared? Because when you are allowing everything to be connected, you are also allowing it to connect to something maybe we don't like, and maybe we can be afraid of it. Exactly. Even exactly. exactly. So, this is why I'm happy to have these technological limitations for the time being. Because everything what you mentioned, that, that do you think that it is safe? Do you think it is reliable? Whatever. Not. This is the problem that the concepts are, are developing faster, and especially these sort of buzzwords. People are talking about uh, industrial internet of things. I have never seen one working implementation apart from something what is documented in a paper. So this is interesting here, that, that I believe it is just good to have problems with the technologies. I mean, that, that uh, it needs, it is rapidly developing, but needs time. But I also believe that all these questions, what you brought, that is it secure or whatever. Sometimes I I'm really fear sending information to uh, an email because I don't know who is on the other side. It is, it is for me a real problem. It is for me a real problem. So when I'm very enthusiastic on one hand towards my discipline, I also see that the knowledge what we really have is not enough to address all these issues. 
cyber physical security, for instance, is completely unknown, especially when you have a self-adopting system. How can you control that the system adaptation is going in that direction, what is expected for us? This is a big philosophical, ethical dilemma at this very moment. And I, I haven't heard any, how to say, progressive solution, or about any progressive solution. So very, very good. Very, I, I do appreciate your, your objective view on the things. There are challenges, there are unsolved issues, there are variables which can be uh, evaluated in multiple ways. But, you know, we have also young talents who can work on these sort of things and make a better future. That's why we all are here. Thank you. Thank you. Very good question. Thank you. Um, I have a question for the one that my just made. Um, can we say that uh, in the future we are uh, trying to achieve a goal of uh, non uh, physical objects, only services with the system? Hope it not happens because I like kissing my daughter and whatever, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it would be different for me if it would be just uh, kissing the virt virtual animation or whatever, you know. Everything has a advantage and a disadvantage. I personally believe that uh, due to this fast development, we are not at a balance point. My feeling is, because I was working in that field as well, for instance, virtual reality, augmented reality, too much, too high expectations were stated. And what was fulfilled? Who has a virtual reality system apart from what is related to the Google Glass? That's the daily reality. Science is also figuring out what not to do, not only what to do. For science, a negative result is as useful as a positive result. But again, I have to, I would like to repeat, according to my view, the largest problem is that when there are rapid developments, the balance takes time to get formed because the filters are not there. What tells uh, nowadays that this research, what I'm propagating here, is really useful? So, this is the scientific skepticism here. Yes, yes, very good. We are happy to have it, but just think about the, the consequences of that. Who thought that uh, uh, when, when the, the smartphone was in, the idea was invented by Nokia, that I read a recent study that in in, in, in one of the Chinese underground, in one coach, they made a kind of counting of how many smartphones were there together with the people. And there were something like 28 people in that coach, all together with more than 400 digital appliances. Do you think it's normal? I don't believe. But what is the solution? This is my daughter. Is it an answer? Tentative, obviously, or uh, uh, a little bit uncertain in the question, but my answer is also a little bit uncertain. But this, uh, this is uh, a dynamic, I believe. Yeah. No one knows where are we going. It is like boiling. Something crystallizing later on, something just disappearing. That's why it is a good question. Then I, virtual, I believe virtual reality was a hype 20 years ago, and nowadays, you know, even the commercial advantages are, are, are vanishing and, and uh, going down. There are, however, many good things which are very useful. Because we, uh, if you cannot magnify a operation, you know, in this size, and you cannot monitor what is there, definitely you have a problem. This is what I can say. Thank you for the question.
This is the easiest question what you have for me. <laughs> <laughs> I have to report. <laughs> I don't know. Look, oh, I, I, like the, the, uh, the, the problem is that I, I have a particular uh, uh, view on it. Mainly that this acceleration cannot last or oh, sorry, it, yeah, it cannot last forever. Because then, in one nanosecond, we will see a world which is changing. We cannot live in that. What I'm first of all expecting, a kind of slowing down. But what I also believe, that uh, history uh, taught me something what I can expect. Rather than running into a new, let's say, industrial revolution, it might be that we revisit something which was left behind unexplored, like the computing. I can imagine that we don't go further on that sort of open trajectory what I sketched up, but I can imagine, for instance, that when we implement quantum computing and when we implement biological computing or whatever, we will revisit those sort of societal needs and societal issues what were, what were left untouched at the time when we had the digital computers. That's what I, I, I but this is my personal opinion, obviously, and, I, and I'm, I'm not a philosopher. The first thing is that I don't believe that the acceleration can, can go beyond any, any uh, limit. It's impossible. There must be an explosion. I already see that, uh, that the things are not so, uh, how to say, cannot be deterministically handled and addressed on all levels, from the highest political level to the very low personal levels. So another thing what I mentioned, sorry for repeating, repeating, repeating it, that uh, we may reconsider what we have done in the past and we don't need a new paradigm just a revisited one. And that, that's what I, 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 I guess uh, would be used. For instance, the, 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 for me, the relationship of uh, humans and computer is completely unclear on a historical perspective. People are saying that, oh, we have uh, even uh, opportunities for reconstruct consciousness. And they say that uh, in addition to the biological basis, we can uh, reconstruct, for instance, consciousness just based on a quantum model. Do we need it? Artificial superintelligence, is it really important for us to have a, a let's say, a artificial superpower just for the reason because uh, it's so tempting to do research in there. So, I'm uncertain. If you ask me 40 years ago, my answers are always, yes, yes, let's do it. Let's team up, let's do it. Now I say, yes, but why? Good question. Yes, sir. So, I was thinking about uh, the smart car example that you gave us earlier and for instance I, I, I see a issue there because for example uh, let's, let's imagine uh, two, ch two little children are crossing a street and the smart car has to make the decision about if mm, they are going to, to get killed or, or me as the conductor uh, I'm going to get, get killed so, do you think it, it's possible in the near future to make that decision correct? Is that decision correct? I mean, it's a good, bad decision for, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, uh, 
please allow me to translate into uh, yeah, say, my thoughts. So, so you say that, uh, that actually, even if we have the technological opportunities to develop intelligent cars, there are other things which we have to take into consideration. And then what is with these other considerations? How they, they can be addressed? Was it uh, uh, something what you wanted to ask? No. What I say, that when we are talking about intelligent car, according to the current conceptualization, it is not one thing. But there are different levels, for instance, what we can uh, target. The low, the, I mean, uh, the, the driving by the driver, immediately followed by the hands-free driving, which means that there are intermezzos when the car comes in and takes over the steering and control functionality. The other thing is the driverless driving. When actually the, the system intelligence, big uh, quotes, reaches a level when the system is able to build awareness what's going on around me and how do I need to adapt to that particular situation. And then comes, for instance, the sport driving issue. When the car is executing a intended transportation mobility plan. When it is not just about what is happening in the car, but also the car figures out if I am in this particular traffic condition, how can I get that? How can I provide that service which manifests in the how to say, or in the passengers being there. And obviously comes the intelligent car, what everybody is talking about, but no one knows what actually it does mean. That's how I see. Your question is very, very good, because one of the PhD students a year ago started to work on, for instance, this sort of hands-free driving. When you let the car to do the driving task, and in the meantime, you do something else, even reading the book. It's fine when there is no obstacle or there is nothing to be obtrusive in that particular process. The problem starts when the person who is in the car should take back the control over the car. If you are engaged with different things, but you have to take back the control, then obviously you are not alert, you are not aware. So then what to do with the driver? Obviously the normal route is control, yes, it is a, something like a pre-programmed thing, but what if it is not working? This is a huge problem. Not the, the, the many people wrote uh, three, four years ago, oh, it is, a, it is an infrastructural pro problem. We cannot uh, have cars which are uh, uh, driven by people and driven automatically together. Because the, how to say, the deterministic driving style of the smart car is completely different than the undetermined st driving style of the person. A person would consider a smart car as a second order citizen. You would always try to overtake it because this cannot have priority. It is a machine. How can I? How can it happen that uh, that actually uh, the this sort of uh, self-driven car is overtaking me? So it it goes to the acrobatics. This is exactly where it goes, that what it raises, what sort of uh, feelings it has, and, and, and how to do it. But again, according to me, the basic problem is the car and the driver, relation, whatever it means, relationship. The responsibility issue is not clarified. If there is anything wrong, even just a failure with the car, who is responsible for that? If there is an accident, who to get the insurance money, the car or the person? If it is a funeral, who has to be carried? So, <laughs> these are all legal 
ethical, social issues, and this is exactly like like the, the mobile phone situation, you know. That you have the mobile phone and it is influencing your personal life because it's taking your attention to other natural things. But as we go into the system, we have to take the other aspects also into consideration. This is what I try to say in the, in the conclusion. If it is not a synergy, it is not a complex thinking, we will not be able to solve the problem. But then the other question is how to capture the complexity, how to deal with it. Yes, we don't know. Our students are, are uh, this is uh, what I always say, that, that obviously if we tell the students you have to be imaginative and whatever, and they are coming well up with so complexities, you know, that, uh, that I cannot advise them how to tackle it. And they are always angry with me. Oh, you are not allowing me to, uh, you, uh, you are conflicting because you say that you, I have to think out of the box and whenever I'm thinking big, you say that, oh, be careful. And they say that I am consistent. I am. This was something, at least, uh, I have to say, periphery, does it, uh, or did it address the question? Or was it meaningful that I said? Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you, sir.